Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Hello, my name is Tim Garrity, and I'm with Paragon Capital Partners. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Raj Ajala of Ajala Legal. Raj, thanks for joining today. A quick bio on Raj is he is a, an estate planning attorney based here in Pasadena, California, Raj helps families and family-owned businesses plan for the unexpected. He specializes in creating customized plans that match his clients' unique wishes, desires, and goals. The estate planning process can be daunting, and it is his goal to make it as easy, efficient, and stress-free for his clients as possible. He strives to provide an atmosphere of understanding and comfort so that families feel comfortable discussing sensitive topics and expressing their wishes. He works with families in person or online offering flexible scheduling and personalized service. His attention to detail ensures that each plan protects his client's wishes, their children, and the legacy they've created. Again, Raj, thanks for joining me. We really appreciate having you here. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. I look forward to having this conversation. Absolutely. And just to kick things off, tell us a little about yourself and your background. So uh, I grew up in Orange County, California, So, and I currently live in LA, practice in Pasadena. Um, I went to undergrad at uh, UC Irvine, so not too far, and ended up going to law school in uh, the University of uh, Santa Clara. So, you know, always been in California, never really left the state. And uh, then I got into law. I've been practicing for almost uh, 13 years now. And uh, yeah. Well, great. And how did you... uh... Find yourself in law school what led you there so it's quite interesting uh i was actually doing a master's program in cell and molecular biology uh, i was talking to a friend of mine who was at law school at the time and i was kind of find uh what my next steps were uh, i wasn't really interested in getting a phd or, or doing work behind a lab bench anything like that so i was talking to him and he told me to look into patent law. And I found that really intriguing. There was, there's something about um, the intersection of law and science that really drew me towards patent and patent law. So when I went to law school, that was my main focus was to utilize my science background and apply it to law. Um, as I, when I graduated law school and I started working, I didn't do as much patent work as I originally wanted to and started doing a lot more litigation. So with litigation, it's um, it's very time consuming, very reactive. Some people just thrive in that environment. Some people, they don't really enjoy it as much. And I think I was one of those people that I, I did the work, I got everything done, but I just didn't enjoy the work. So um, at some point I started to look out into what was available, what other types of practices I that I could do. And so I started looking into estate planning and that's uh, how I got to where I'm at now. Well, I wouldn't say that's a typical background of the attorneys I know, pretty fascinating for sure. And you and I have talked uh, at other times and I I know um, the estate planning side of things hopefully gives you a little better lifestyle in terms of managing family and things like that. Whereas litigation, sometimes your calendar is not your own. Is that pretty much accurate? Oh, that's completely accurate. You know, with estate planning, I am scheduling meetings with clients. I work with their schedule. So I have a lot of flexibility with litigation. You're working with opposing counsel. You have the courts, you have other um, vendors that you're working with. So your calendar is not really your own. It's at the mercy of everybody else. And so with estate planning, I was able to kind of take a step back and just kind of retake control of my calendar and the work that I was doing. Well, and it probably can give a lot more attention individually to clients as well. So that's, um, I'm sure the work product shows. Um, specifically though, what does estate planning mean to you for our um, those listening and watching uh, who might not really know exactly what entails? So 
for me, estate planning is, is helping clients with a specific issue. And that issue is providing them with a plan for the future, whether that is um, their desire to pass their wealth on to their children, whether they want to pass that wealth on to charities. And it also, if they want to um, consider some sort of other uh, way that they want to pass their legacy, their wealth, and everything else to what people or uh, entities they consider very valuable to them. So when I say estate planning, it covers uh, a lot of things, but essentially it's just a plan that people can create that will provide them with um, giving their assets, their wealth, their money that they've accumulated over their lifetime to whoever they want to. But it also goes a little bit deeper into uh, setting up a plan for people who want uh, people to take care of them if, in case they have uh, an incapacity, they're in a coma, they're unable to speak for themselves. So they need someone who can make those decisions on their behalf. So, you know, that there's a, a healthcare aspect to it. There's also a financial aspect with the power of attorney. So same situation, unable to make decisions on their own. They nominate someone who can make those decisions for them. So that's a, what I believe a, a crucial aspect of estate planning is not just passing on the inheritance, but also having a plan for people to take care of you when you're unable to take care of yourself. Excellent. That's um, really helpful. And how did you establish your own firm? I know in the past you said you'd work for other firms that were larger. Yeah. So for me, it was just finding the practice that I thought that I would excel in and enjoy. And then it came down to, you know, putting up my own shingle, setting up the website and basically meeting uh, different types of advisors to people and letting them know this is how I can help them. People like you, uh, accountants, other financial advisors. So they're always help trying, looking to help their clients to get a better uh, handle, not only on the financial side, but also ways that they can protect those assets. So that's where I come in and, and help them with an estate plan. Yeah, I know. Interesting. In my experience, too, uh, a lot of the estate planning attorneys out there are fairly seasoned, if I can say it correctly. You know, uh, there's not quite as many, you know, under 60 or under 50. Um, so it's important that good folks like you are, are kind of diving in because the, the need is just going to grow. Um, so, you know, it's exciting to have you here. And I mentioned you're in Pasadena, but you probably serve clients in a little broader geographic area than that. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I've had clients uh, as far south as San Diego. I've had clients as far north as Sacramento. Um, you know, it's just a flexibility uh, on my side to be able to help those clients as much as I can. Um, I try to do things creatively. If they're able to meet on Zoom, then cuts down the travel. Um, but at the same time, there are times when I do have to meet face to face with the clients. And, you know, that's just one aspect of being an estate planning attorney is that there will be times during the process where there has to be a sit down face to face. Absolutely. Well, so many of us have got pretty comfortable with Zoom and the video stuff. So that's helpful. But you're right. There also is sometimes where the face to face is um, obviously essential, but also you can kind of a lot of what you do is drawing out feelings and values. And that's a lot easier to do in person where you can see their body language. And if it's a husband and wife, um, you kind of see how they interact and, and you can probably ask follow up questions that way. Oh, absolutely. Yes. It, it's it's almost uh, like a psychological experiment to kind of understand mm -hmm. and kind of read to make sure that you've got all the information you need and you understand the family dynamics so that um, there isn't an issue that pops up later that kind of takes you by surprise. And all of a sudden, everything that you've worked for to put together is now kind of at a loss because you didn't get the full picture. And um, who would an ideal client be or an ideal family or the folks that you work with? So most of my clients are uh, usually young families with children. Um, they have their savings account, investment accounts, and they also might have an investment property or two. So those are the typical clients I work with. I also do have clients. I don't, uh, I also have clients that I work with who are retirees or close to retiring. They have adult children and they also have, you know, the savings account, retirement accounts, investment accounts, and they might also have 
uh, an investment property or two as well. So I, I wouldn't say that I, I have all types of families, but you know, those are the two main that um, typically work with me. And these plans are generally decide, are designed to be flexible so that down the road changes can be made. I, I know there is another topic of irrevocable trust and things of that nature, but generally speaking, the work you do uh, is something that down the line could be changed if, if something changes in their life, right? Yeah, so most of the plans that I uh, create are going to be revocable living trusts. Mm -hmm. And like you said, they can be amended, they can be changed to fit the the situation or the dynamics that might have changed so they're they they're able to come back and make those changes and it's not too much of an issue whereas like you mentioned irrevocable trust it's not so easy to change sometimes it requires uh, court intervention which is is not the cheapest or the easiest thing to get done so irrevocable is definitely more adaptable to a changing situation and a follow-up to that then is if someone um, did work with another attorney, maybe they uh, moved down here or that attorney left the business or, you know, God forbid, passed away, um, that doesn't preclude you from working with them, right? You could still change what someone else did. Yeah, that's true. Um, work, I've had a, a few clients who, you know, they probably created a trust 20 years ago mm -hmm. and they hadn't spoken to their estate planning attorney since the time that that the estate plan was created. So, and now I'm coming in 20, 25 years later and helping to update it because some of the crucial aspects were left out or, you know, the, the family dynamics changed. They had another child or they had more children. And so now it's up to me to kind of either create uh, a new plan that fits their lifestyle better, or if it's possible to just amend what needs to be amended so that, you know, it, it's still serving them the way it was originally intended to. Makes sense. Well, I think we have a good feel for, for who you serve very well. How do they generally find you? Um... So most of my clients come from referrals. So um, usually it's uh, CPAs that I've worked with, financial advisors, and um, actually, my former clients or clients that I've worked with, they will tell their friends and family that uh, we work with Raj. He did a great job for us. And we think he could help you as well. So I'll get a phone call saying, you know, so-and-so referred me and I'd like you to help us put together an estate plan. Yeah, that's great. And I think those of us who are advisors in different aspects like insurance and tax, we we try to ask broader questions, even if it's not a discipline that we deal with, because hopefully we're trying to do the best for the client in, in all areas, holistically, if you will. So mm -hmm. it's great to see the process is working in terms of that. So um, what are some of the common issues that you see come up from time to time with, with most of your clients? So the common issue that I see is probably going to be dealing with just getting all the assets together and realizing what they have and what they've uh where everything is at. Sometimes I'll put together an estate plan and the clients won't tell me where everything is at or, or all their accounts. So that kind of becomes an issue because later down the road, if all those accounts aren't managed or accounted for, um, then who's going to know where they are and who's going to be able to you know, take control of them and pass them on to who they need to be passed on to. You know, we have a situation where somebody might be having a separate account or they might just be stashing money behind a drawer in their dresser. And then if they don't, if nobody else knows where that is and that dresser gets tossed out or that person dies and nobody else knows that that account is there, you know, pretty soon you're going to have the state coming in and reclaiming it because no one has claimed it. and No one knows that it exists. Interesting. And also I've... Uh... I've I've known friends or clients that although they had a trust set up over the years, they acquire different assets and either forget or, um, you know, just get complacent and don't add those to the trust. It's really easy once you have the trust set up, correct? Oh, yeah. It's just a matter of if it's a real estate property, you just change the grant deed. Mm -hmm. um, usually the attorneys can help. Sometimes if when you buy it, uh, a new property, the uh 
real estate agent or the escrow company can help to put it in the right title. So you would tell them, I have a trust. I'd like to put it in the trust. Bank accounts, investment accounts, brokerage accounts, those are generally easily done by calling the bank or going to the branch office mm -hmm. and having that done. Um, there is sometimes an issue that comes up where if, uh, hold on one second. Okay, I lost my train of thought on that one. Oh, that's okay. We can cut that one out. Um, doing great so far. So um, how about some common misconceptions that people have about estate planning or trusts in general? Yeah, Tim, there's a lot of misconceptions that are out there. The first one is a lot of people think you have to be rich. You have to be wealthy. You're you know, in millions and millions of dollars cash just sitting around to create a trust. And that one is not true. Uh, in California, if you own a house and you have investment accounts and you have a children, those are all great reasons to set up a trust. Um, there's always that idea of like, oh, this person's rich, their, their child is a trust fund baby, they don't have to work, everything comes out. But, you know, a trust, it, it helps a lot of people in different ways. And so it definitely helps the wealthy, but it also helps other people as well. So, you know, if middle class who are almost all my clients, um, you know, you have a trust, you have the advanced healthcare directive aspect, and you have the financial aspect. So I, I definitely don't think that you need to be super wealthy to create a trust. Uh, another misconception is sometimes people will say, well, I have a will, and I think that's good enough. And so, you know, with that, the situation is, is there's not a complete understanding of what happens when you have a will. And with that, it's an issue that comes up and we could probably jump into it a little bit later about dealing with probate. But when you have a will, you know, the will only comes into effect when you die. And so before that, it really doesn't have any effect on your life. So, you know, just having a will is in, in California is probably not going to be sufficient enough um, and then also, if it's just the will and it's not an estate plan, you're missing out on a lot of key components that can help you later in life. Well, that's great. So you kind of um, alluded to this, but what happens then if someone really should but doesn't have an estate plan here in California? So luckily, California has their own plan, and it's called um, intestacy. And so it's the probate process. And probate process is essentially a lawsuit against yourself. Um, your personal representative, or if you have a will, your executor will file a petition for the court to begin the probate process. Um, the process it is expensive because based on statutory law, there are certain amounts that are given to the lawyers and the personal representative. So if it's a million dollars of assets that is going through probate, the personal representative and the attorney each get about $23,000. So you add that up, that's $46,000 that's coming out of your estate before it gets passed on to the children. The other thing is that it's very time consuming. So in California, uh, a standard probate process goes for about 18 months to 24 months. And the other thing is that it's a court process. So anything that goes through the court is gonna be a public document. So one of the processes uh, in the probate case is that you have to do an accounting. So that means you have to tally up all the income that's coming in versus all the debt that's coming in. You also have to do an inventory. And the inventory is going to be listing all the bank accounts and the value of the bank accounts. So you can imagine that if all, these, all this information is public, there's going to be people out there who know how to look that up, find the people who are going to be getting that money, and start you know, devising schemes to either scam them out of the money or try to just get to a point where they'll be able to access that money for themselves. So that's one issue uh, of probate that um, isn't really talked about that much, but it's the privacy issue. You don't want everything that you've worked so hard to be out there in public like that. 
Absolutely. Well, and it's not just the uh, the, the middle class that um, sometimes don't do the planning. I just heard recently that I think someone worth a billion dollars just passed away without any kind of planning whatsoever. So that's going to be a massive probate. And um, you can just imagine the circus that'll surround that, I'm sure. So. Oh, yeah. And you alluded to this also, but um, just uh, to give us a good sense, the difference between a will and a trust um, sounds like you really need both. Yeah. So when you set up an estate plan, you can have it set up with both. You can have either a trust-based or a will-based. If it's trust-based, you will generally have what's called a pour-over will or a will. If you just have a will that's a uh, estate plan that's will-based, you're not going to have that trust aspect. So what the trust is, is essentially it's a contract between three parties. You have the grantors who create the trust, You'll have the trustees who manage the trust and you'll have the beneficiaries. So these are the people who will benefit from the trust. When you create a revocable living trust, what happens is all these three parties are essentially the same. It's the husband and wife who created it. So they create the trust, they manage the trust, and they're managing it for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. The children will come in and they'll be successor beneficiaries. Um, you can have successor trustees who can come in and manage the trust if you're unable to. So if you have um, uh, siblings that you trust, friends that you trust, and sometimes adult children, if you know that they're the responsible ones, they can be the successor, uh, successor trustees. And they'll be able to come in and manage the trust without having to change um, the ownership of the title for all the assets. And so that makes it easy. Whereas when you have a will, you know, what you have is a document that says, when I die, this is where how everything will be distributed. So with the will, it only comes into play when you die. And then with the will, it will go through the probate process. So without a will or with the will, you'll go through the probate process. If you have a trust, what happens is that will that comes with the trust will be submitted to the court and that'll be all that there is to that. So you don't have this long drawn out court process with the trust. Yeah, that's great information. Do you have a story of the planning process going wrong or someone not planning adequately? Yeah, I did have, I have a client um, who was in an accident and suffered severe injuries and was unable to um, communicate. So when the spouse went there and they gave him all the information about the medical condition, uh, when he wanted to, to have some optional surgeries done, he couldn't do it. And that's because, you know, when it comes down to a person owning the rights to their body, it's the individual person. Right. So even if you're a spouse, you can't necessarily okay a procedure for your spouse. So in that case, what happened is we had to go get a conservatorship. And so now the spouse has the authority to make the decisions for the healthcare and well-being of the other spouse. And this can be avoided if you have an estate plan. One of the aspects I mentioned was the advanced healthcare directive. And this allows you to nominate someone who can make those decisions when you're unable to make those. So I, I feel like the healthcare aspect is one of the most important parts of estate planning because you don't know what the future holds. You could be driving and get into an accident you could end up having a serious illness that you didn't know you were predisposed to. And all of a sudden you're unable to make any of these decisions. You can't communicate, you could be in a coma. Or as we grow older now, people are having uh, dementia and you know they need to be taken care of. So it's good that when you're younger or you're still feeling healthy to go ahead and make those decisions about who's gonna be taking care of you. Absolutely. And so um, the other thing that I think of with my clients, too, is that we're just all, generally speaking, living so much longer. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, one spouse um, starts going downhill in terms of dementia or something like that. And it's great to have that in place. But uh, a, a partner of that would be uh, something called a durable power of attorney. I think you mentioned earlier as well, right? Those are kind of like twin documents. Yeah. So generally with the advanced healthcare directive, and this has a couple different names as well. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a living will. Sometimes it's it's got a couple different names, but so that covers the healthcare side of everything. With the durable power of attorney, that covers the financial side of things. 
So if somebody was to have a separate account, say they run a business, they're the owner of the business, but the spouse isn't on uh, any of the titles for the business or the bank accounts, you know, that business owner needs to have a durable power of attorney in case something happens to him. The spouse can go in and say, okay, I have, I am the agent for him. I need to take care of some of uh, the accounts, you know, whether it's paying the bills, whether it's taking money out to pay for medical bills or anything like that. Wow. So if I understand correctly, um, most of your clients are in the position where they should have a will, a trust, and then these other two documents, the durable power of attorney and the advanced health care directive. So that's generally speaking, the package that ultimately you help them design. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty much what's uh, included in the estate plan. There are additional documents. Sometimes if uh, the families have young children, you want to include a nomination for guardianship in case something happens to them. You want to be able to spell out who's going to be taking care of the children. For example, if uh, the husband and wife, the mom and dad go out to dinner, babysitter is watching the kids, it's two o'clock in the morning and the parents haven't returned. Maybe they've gotten to an accident or something. So there needs to be a plan of who the babysitter is going to call. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if the babysitter is thinking like, okay, they haven't come, I should call the police. Well, when the police come, what they'll do is they'll take custody of the children and they'll put them in the foster care system until they find the next of kin. So that could be two days, three days, four days. If the uh, next of kin is living in state. If they're living on the other side of the country, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer to find them and then to make travel arrangements to come and pick up the children. So, you know, if there's young children and you have a nomination for the guardianship, it's important that the babysitter knows these are the people to call if we don't come home. Once those people have custody of the children, then you can go ahead and call the police and say something's wrong. Got it. Well, those are, yeah, good things. We don't think about that, but it's important to, to have that in place. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, I understand you also are able to advise clients on corporate formation as, as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so sometimes my clients will have an investment property and generally you can put those into a trust. Sometimes they want the peace of mind of knowing that it's protected. So I will create an LLC and we can put the investment property into the LLC. One of the big reasons people want to do that is what you're doing is you're separating your personal assets from the assets of the LLC. So if something were to happen at the house, a slip and fall or some sort of injury or damage to the house, those people would not be able to sue you personally because you have created a new entity that is the owner of the house. And um, sometimes also people will want to start their own business and they decide they want to start with an LLC. So, yeah, I help uh, clients with different ideas to help build their startups and, and create a, a structure and an entity that will help separate their new startup or their investment property from their personal assets. Got it. I know there's lots of uh, intricacies to LLCs and um, as it um, as it gets into the tax situation, it sounds like you have... CPAs and accountants you work with that can answer any of those questions um, if it gets to that point, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, one of the key things about um, the LLC is the uh, it, it's taxed at the personal level, whereas sometimes people want to do a corporation, whether it's a C Corp or an S Corp. With the C Corp, you get a double taxation, which is not what a lot of people want to be dealing with when they're setting up something. So, you know, with an LLC, it's a little bit easier to manage in terms of the requirements to maintain annually. And then um, you're not taxed at the higher level uh, like you are with the C-Corps. Excellent. Um, well, this is great. Uh, I think your background gives you a unique skill set and not only for estate planning, but obviously for the, the corporate formation we talked about. Any closing thoughts you have for us? You know, I always... Uh, want to emphasize that if you have young children, you have property, um, and if you even just have basic uh, savings account, retirement accounts, investment accounts, it's never too early to start thinking about estate planning. Um, you know, this is an opportunity to put your wishes, your desires, and your goals down on paper so that if something were to happen to you, 
and you were unable to make those decisions or you were unable to convey your wishes, those that has all the process has already taken place where it's been written down. So, you know, the, this is an opportunity to go ahead and start that process. Well, this is great, Raj. I can't thank you enough for joining me. Um, these are awesome thoughts on, on a really important topic that sometimes people either don't understand or maybe they're a little afraid of. So I think this will go a long way into uh, motivating people to take some action. And uh, along those lines, what would the best way for someone to get um, um, in touch with you if they wanted to? At least so uh, they can visit the website. It's Ajla Legal, A-U-J-L-A-L-E-G-A-L.com. Or they can email me directly at raj at ajlalegal.com. So it's R-A-J at A-U-J-L-A-L-E-G-A-L.com. Great. Well, thank you so much, Raj. Good luck with everything. Thank you so much, Tim. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.